Good morning. It's lovely to see you this morning. Welcome, uh, especially if you're here in person, and also welcome if you're watching online. By way of announcements, please do read through your announcement sheets, a number of things to see there uh, in terms of, of what's happening um, in the next week. And just to, to mention a couple of things that are on the screen. Again, I'm going to be reading the service the next couple of weeks as we continue our series in uh, what the Spirit says to the church. And then our discipleship group is going to be meeting again this Wednesday and Thursday night. Uh, again, please do, um, e even yet, if you would like to come to the Bible, the, the discipleship groups, please feel free to do that. Mention it to me and we can get you slotted into one of the groups. Also, you'll see there that as uh, Jimmy made his announcement last week about the uh, MOP, or the uh, Maintenance of Property Appeal, just to remind you about that. And also to, uh, to let you know there's heat in the months again. Uh, we've got the boiler sorted out, and uh, amazing job. So thank you to Jimmy and to the rest of the Maintenance of Property Committee, and also uh, to you who've contributed to the Maintenance of Property. Uh, we've got heat, and uh, everything is working really well again. It's marvelous, so thank you for, for that. Uh, also, just to mention the various other things, are the, the, the uh, prayer diary for March and the Presbyterian Herald uh, are available in the, in the church porch. And then also Congregational Committee meeting uh, tomorrow night, 7.30 for the main committee, 7 o'clock for Finance uh, Committee. And then just to mention North Belfast Food Bank, the shopping list for March. If you want to have a quick look at that to see what's needed, uh, if you can provide uh, any of those things, would be very helpful. And then also to uh, invite you again to stay for tea and coffee after the service. Um, opportunity, I think more and more people are taking the opportunity to do that, to spend time uh, having coffee or tea together. It's really good, good to see that. So you're invited to, to stay afterwards. As we come together this morning, I want to focus our thoughts um, on this verse. These two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Uh, we're going to be thinking about Jesus, um, who is faithful. And these verses come into my mind. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This morning, we're going to be focusing as we think about Jesus' words to the church in Philadelphia about the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of Christ and how He continues to work with us, to encourage us, and to strengthen us. And so those words just remind us of who God is and how He works in our lives. We're going to sing together as we stand. Uh, there is a higher throne.
We're going to turn to God's Word in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through to 13. I'm going to read from the New International Version, uh, thinking about the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 3. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's Word for us this morning. We're going to join together in prayer. So let's pray together. Our God, we come before you this morning as the faithful one, the one who does not change. Your steadfast love continues through all generations. You tell us that you have chosen us before the beginning of the world and that you love us with an everlasting love so that we are able to dwell in the shelter of the Most High and abide in the shadow of the Almighty. As we come before you this morning, we're reminded that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And so we come before you this morning in awe, wanting to learn more of you and to know you better. We give you thanks this morning for the love, joy, peace, and hope that we are able to experience through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is through His blood that we are able to overcome as we battle with sin and with Satan. We know that through all the experiences of our lives, we are able to know the goodness of our God, that You have provided every spiritual blessing that we need in Jesus Christ to supply us and to help us to keep going. Father, this morning we come before you and we thank you for the privilege of being able to bring our prayers to you. We pray this morning for all those who for whatever reason feel the need to leave their homeland to try to find a better life. We pray for our government in working out policies which maintain human dignity and common love, as well as realizing that all things belong to you and not to us. Help us to be good stewards of all that you've given to us, to care for the stranger amongst us, and to share all things with others. We pray too for peace in the midst of the continuing war in Ukraine, 
We pray that the international community will be able to resolve this conflict with justice and fairness. We pray that it will not escalate to involve other nations. Father, we pray to you for our politicians here and also in Westminster as they work through the Windsor framework, seeking to find agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom. We ask that you would enable them as they seek to deal with the problems of the movement of goods between the European single market and the, European, and the United Kingdom. Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for sensitivity. We pray for agreement as we seek to move forward. Father, too, we give you thanks for the calling that you've given to us to follow you, to go into all the world and to make disciples. Give us courage as we seek to follow you and lead us by your Spirit. Remember, too, this morning, those in our congregation who need our prayers, those struggling, those who've been bereaved, those who are ill, those caring for loved ones, those struggling with their mental health, those who have difficult choices to make. Father, we remember each one who needs your encouragement, your strength, and your grace today. And so we ask that you would hear our prayers. So we pray each of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to sing together again. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for your word this morning and for the encouragement that we're able to receive from it as we think about the God who is faithful, the God who continues to work with us and sometimes is contrasted with our unfaithfulness. Lord, we pray this morning that you would speak to each of us, that we might be aware of your presence, uh, leading us by your Holy Spirit. And as you reminded, have reminded us in each of these letters that you've written to the churches in Asia Minor, so help us to hear what the Spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come this morning to think about uh, the sixth church in Asia Minor to whom Jesus speaks, I think it's important, and maybe this is something I haven't said uh, previously, but it's important to acknowledge as we come to study the, what Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia this morning, we are not Philadelphia, nor are we Ephesus, nor are we Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, or Sardis. We are not those churches. We are Rosemary Presbyterian Church living in North Belfast in 2023 in March. And so these letters are not written directly to us, so we don't assume the character and personality of these churches. We are living in a very different culture and context from each of these churches, and we cannot and don't want to take on their identity. Jesus is speaking into very specific situations with particular issues that needed to be addressed. But what we can do is take some of the principles that he speaks about and then seek to apply them in our situation. So the very direct words that are spoken to each of the churches are not necessarily directly spoken to us, but the principles behind them are for us, for us to apply and to learn from them. I think that's really important for us to, to do that because it is easy to take on the identity of the church and think, well, that's us. That, you know, well, for example, for last time where, you know, you have a reputation for being alive, but you're actually dead. Or some of the other things that are said. Those were spoken specifically to churches in that time. So Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia was founded in 140 BC with the intention that it would be a city that would promote the culture of the time, the Roman culture of the time. And so Philadelphia was the main route between Rome and the East with potential for economic prosperity. Um, and especially with the, it was a grape growing area. And so that was one of the, the industries that was kind of uh, productive for the people there who grew grapes. It was also a center of worship uh, for gods such as Dionysus. Um, and then the believers in Philadelphia, as we discover, were, were also persecuted by Jews living in Philadelphia and also by the Romans and, and the whole Caesar worship. And I, I suppose a bit like Smyrna. So that's Philadelphia. And, and like... Um, Sardis. It was affected by an earthquake uh, in 17 BC, uh, which then had to start a process of rebuilding. And, and again, that would probably have brought some fears. Maybe it wasn't. I don't think it was affected as much as Sardis, but it was affected by the earthquake. So there you have Philadelphia. Again, very different to our context here in Belfast and how we're called to live out our faith in this situation. But it's again in this city that Jesus has established his church to be his light. Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia has a lampstand like the six other churches along with it. Again, we will read this church has little strength, but it's still holding on in faith and not denying Jesus. They were staying strong with their focus on Jesus despite their weakness. And it's interesting that Jesus commends them, and there's no reservations. There's nothing that he's pointing out that's going wrong or whatever. And so one of the keys and key things that we learn in each of these letters 
It's what Jesus says about himself. And as Jesus points out things about himself, then this church in Philadelphia is able to look to him and trust instead of looking to and focusing on their circumstances, which we all have a danger in, in doing that we tend to get focused on what we're going through or, or what's happening tomorrow or the next day or a few days or, or what has happened in the past week or that we're struggling to deal with. And, and the focus becomes our circumstances and begin to maybe feel as if we're being taken under by those things. And yet Jesus comes along and points out who he is so that they might focus on him and not their circumstances. Lead to trust. And so in each letter, at the very start of it, the words of him, and then it goes on. In each letter, we see the sufficiency of Jesus contrasted with the weakness or even the failure of the church. The insufficiency. And I suppose for us, that's something that we always see, isn't it? We see the sufficiency of Jesus for our circumstances, and we see the insufficiency of ourselves the things that we struggle with, the things that we can't fix, the things that we can't deal with, the things that we, we, we just don't know how we're going to react or how we're going to deal with. And so Jesus then says to him, these are the words of him who is holy and true. So what's he saying? How is he encouraging him with those words? Well, the Holy One refers to the fact that Jesus is God. Only one could be referred to as holy. In the Old Testament, we read in Isaiah 40 and verse 25, and I used the Holy One in, in our prayer from Proverbs 9 and verse 10. We read of, in the Old Testament of God spoken of as the Holy One of Israel. And so Jesus is referring to himself to the Holy One of Israel, that he is God. And he's able to deal with our circumstances, if he is the Holy One of Israel, if he is God, the one who has brought the universe into to place, which we're told about in John 1, then surely he's able to be Lord of our circumstances. He's able to be with us in each of the circumstances that we find ourselves. So the Holy One refers to the fact that Jesus is God and that he is able to be with them in their lives that he is the one who is resurrected, that he is the one who is alive, that he is the one who is over all things and controls all things. But the true one as well. The true one refers to the trustworthiness and the faithfulness of Jesus. So that not only is he God, but he is faithful and we are able to rely on him. We're able to trust him. There is nothing false in him and he is not unfaithful. He is faithful to all of his people. That's what we've been singing about. That's how God reveals himself in the Old Testament, the steadfast love of the Lord. As we think about the, the story of Hosea, whenever the people of God were walking away from him, and he keeps coming, illustrated from Hosea's life with his wife Gomer, who, who left him on several occasions, and God kept coming back to Israel as Hosea kept going back for his wife who was wayward. Those words in Hosea chapter 11, how can I give you up away from him? This is the faithfulness of God. Sometimes we wonder how on earth God can be so faithful to us. But we're also told that Jesus holds the key of David. I always think that if you've, if you've got keys, you're an important person. And again, I suppose it depends what the keys open. It might open your house, it open, open various other things. But it says here he is the keys of David, and what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Some think that that might refer, the key of David is referring to the, the key of the palace, to allow people to enter the palace or not enter it, close it, open it. But what we're being told here and what the, the, the Philadelphians need to realize is that Jesus has ultimate authority. No one can interfere with what he does. 
Admission and exclusion into the kingdom of God are solely in the hands of Jesus. Now, why, why is he saying that? Well, it suggested that this could be a contrast to the Jews as he refers to, as he refers to the synagogue of Satan. The Jews were probably excluding the Christians from entering the temple, from the synagogues. They were rejected with Jesus, and so they received a closed door at the synagogue because of their faith and their trust in Jesus. And that's why Jesus is saying, I hold the key. What I open, no one can shut. And what I shut, no one can open. As I said, we're not Philadelphia. But maybe we feel sometimes we receive a closed door. A closed door when it comes to entering the kingdom of God through faith. And there's been no encouragement. A closed door whenever it comes to offering and service. You haven't been included. A closed door whenever it comes to friendship. And you haven't been welcomed. We're told in the New Testament that Jesus is the door through whom we enter into his kingdom. He is the one who opens the door. He's the one who closes the door. In this context for Philadelphia, it wasn't the Jews. It was Jesus. And therefore, Jesus is encouraging the people of the church in Philadelphia to look to him. To trust him. To go to him. To talk to him. Because he is the one through whom they're able to receive the open door. What an encouragement for us to realize that Jesus is the one who has the keys. He is the holy one, the faithful one, and the one who opens and closes the door as we enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know, like, like Philadelphia, those words were meant to encourage the church And as we go into this incoming week, to think about those words. The Holy One. That Jesus is God as he interacts and relates to us in our lives. As he deals with the universe. That he is the the true one, the faithful one, the trustworthy one. The one that we can depend on. Who will not let us down. No matter what our circumstances are. Just as Jesus does with all the other churches, he knows all about the church in Philadelphia. And he tells them exactly what he knows. And he tells them, as we read in verse 8, he says, says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So he tells them he knows their deeds and he knows they have little strength and he knows that they have not denied him and he knows that he has opened a door for them that no one can shut. He says, I know your deeds. I know you how you have sought to follow me despite the opposition and the closed doors that you've experienced. But he tells them that he has set an open door before them and no one is able to to shut it. I suppose that's a verse that we have often heard quoted whenever people have been thinking about personal guidance, personal circumstances. And they say, well, I came across this verse and I felt God was saying, well, he's opened the door and nobody's going to shut it and I'm going to go through it. That possibly might be right. The fact that God may have opened a door and that. But the context in which Jesus says this is to the church in Philadelphia. 
for a particular reason. Some understand this open door as an opportunity to engage in the mission of Jesus in the world in a or in a particular place. Whenever we think about Paul, whenever he says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. So he's talking about an open door. In Colossians 4, in verse 3, he says it's something similar. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So there is the open door to mission, to the mission of the kingdom, to the mission of Christ as individuals or as a church. The fulfilling of that mission is through Christ opening doors. He is the one who opens doors of opportunity. He is the one who is already in the situation doing his work by the power of his Holy Spirit. The power of the open door where Jesus is at work and it's not just about us. It's not just about us deciding, well, I'm going to do this, or I like to do this, or I want to do that. And then, Lord, will you bless it? Jesus is opening doors through which we are able to go into mission, into the way in which he calls us. But we can also see this as Jesus opening a door into his kingdom through faith that he has made it possible for us to enter the kingdom of God through his birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension back to his Father. Indeed, we're told earlier on in Revelation 1 that he is the keys of death and Hades. And while the Jews might shut the synagogue doors to the believers in Philadelphia, they cannot shut the doors of the kingdom. And I think perhaps that's what this is about in this verse. As Jesus speaks to the church in Philadelphia, it's only Jesus who can open and shut doors, not the Jews. And this is what Jesus is trying to remind them, to bring them encouragement, particularly as they face a shut door and exclusion from what the Jews see to be the kingdom of God in Philadelphia. But Jesus also reminds them that he knows that they have little power or strength not sure exactly what that means. It might be that they were small in number. It might be that they had very little influence in the community in which they were living and trying to be a witness. It might be the fact that they had no ability to make anything happen. But we're told that they are weak. And while we're told that God's strength is most revealed in our weakness, that doesn't mean that we all should be seeking to be weak. What is being encouraged here is dependence on Christ and not weakness per se. You see, the reality is that we are all different with different gifts. We're different financially, academically, physically, socially. We have different skills and talents and training. But whatever we possess, whoever we are, we are encouraged towards humility and away from self-sufficiency. And that's the key here. As James reminds us, God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Warren Wiersbe in his commentary says this, it is not the size or strength of the church that determines its ministry, but faith in the call and command of the Lord. I think that's really good. It's not the size or the strength of the church that determines its ministry. That's for, certainly for Philadelphia here, that's the case, because it was small and weak and it's not that size or strength of the church that determines its ministry. 
but faith in the call and the command of God, believing that we are doing what he has asked us to do. And so in the midst of this weakness, whatever it was, these believers kept Jesus' word and did not deny his name. They were faithful and did not embrace the heretical teaching around them or turn away from Jesus. They kept Jesus' word and sought to do what he asked of them. Do you remember Jesus' words? To repent, to believe the good news, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, to love your neighbor as yourself, to reach out to meet the needs of others, whether they're sick or strangers or in prison or wherever they are, to receive the Holy Spirit, to follow him so that he will make us fish for men and women. They did not deny Jesus' name. Unlike Peter and the other disciples, whenever they were put under pressure, they didn't deny that they followed Jesus, that they knew him. But you know, Jesus gives the church in Philadelphia three promises as they face the days ahead. And I think it's important for us as we seek to follow Jesus, we're called to follow him with faithfulness, not to deny him, not to be silent, not to be practically denying him either through lives or our lives or our words. But he gives him three promises, and we can hold those three promises today. He says to the, the Philadelphians, your detractors will know that I have loved you. The faithfulness of the Philadelphians to Jesus had led to the exclusion from the synagogue. And so Jesus is showing that he cares about his people and how they are treated. Those who are mistreating the believers now will all bow down before Christ to confess that he is Lord and before his disciples, his followers. He also points out that on that day their detractors and persecutors will realize I have loved you. This will be a real revelation to those who, are think, those who think they are following God's ways, who are making judgments on the spiritual status of others based on their own rules and regulations. That's what's, what was happening in Philadelphia. It will be clear that even though they have judged them to be outside of the kingdom and not part of, of God's kingdom, they will realize as they bow before Christ that he has loved them. Do you know, that's the experience for all of us in the sense that we, as we come to faith in Christ, as we seek to follow him, that he loves us and that he will make that clear as we bow before him on that final day, as we trust him in Christ, as we overcome through the blood of the Lamb in Jesus Christ. And so in truth, it really doesn't matter what anyone thinks of us or how they judge us. What matters is what Jesus thinks and that we are holding on to him. He then goes on to promise, I will keep you in the hour of trial coming your way. Some misunderstand this as saying that, well, Jesus will take away all your troubles and that all our lives will be free of trouble if we follow him. It will be comfortable. But Jesus is reminding these believers that he will be with them as they go through the trouble. I suppose it's consistent with what Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 15. He says, My prayer is not that you will take them out of the world, but that you will protect them from the evil one. So Jesus is praying that we will not be taken out of our troubles, that they'll all be taken away and we find, find it easy, but rather that, that God will protect us as we face the evil one. Again, James reminds us, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. We won't go through the same trials and tribulations and troubles that the believers in Philadelphia were going through. 
but we all go through tough and difficult times, and maybe even perhaps only that you know about. Sometimes directly because of our faith, maybe even because of the questions that we face, the difficulties that we try to go through, or maybe even through just the normal circumstances of our lives. And yet we know that through those tough times, this promise is that Jesus will not leave us. He will walk with us and give us the grace that we need and the strength. But the third promise that he gives to them is that I'm coming soon. This is a promise. It's not one of those threats or warnings or danger signs. It is a promise. Jesus will return to gather those who are depending on him. And so he says, hold fast to what you have so that no one will seize your crown. As we look forward to Christ's return, it's not the time to give up. It's not the time to deny Jesus. It's the time to look forward. It's the time to depend more. It's the time to hold on to him tighter. And just a wee word of encouragement for you this morning as we think about that, because we live in a day whenever it is easy to get distracted in our Christian faith, to turn away from Christ and to allow other things to come in, whatever that is. Jesus reminds us, I give them eternal life that they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Twice, he tells us, no one can snatch us out of his hand. Maybe you feel under pressure this morning in your Christian faith. Maybe you're feeling as if you're holding on for grim death or by a very thin hair. And then he goes on to remind us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul also reminds us, I fought the good fight. It is a fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me that crown of righteousness, the one, the crown that Jesus is talking to the Philadelphians about, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I've fought the fight. I want to receive the crown. We're told in Scripture and particularly those words in Hebrews 10 that remind us, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. We keep going. Let's renew ourselves in those promises that God gives to us today through Jesus Christ to be strong in his grace and in his mighty resurrection power. This church in Philadelphia is struggling. It is weak. But Jesus comes alongside to tenderly build them up. They are struggling and wounded in their experience of faith. But Jesus says to them that the one who overcomes, he will make a pillar in the temple of God and they will never leave it. This is to a people who couldn't get into the temple. The closed door is now opened because of Jesus. They will overcome. And I love those words in Revelation 12 that tell us that we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb accomplishes everything for us in faith. And the word of our testimony is about that blood of the Lamb. It is about the goodness and the faithfulness of God, the Holy One who is true and is dependable. 
And so Jesus says that he will write on that person God's name, the name of God, the city of God, and also Jesus' own new name. One of the commentators, I just I love this, whenever he just says, what is written over these believers in Philadelphia and also will be written over us eventually in that day is just the word mine. That we belong to Jesus. That's what he's telling these believers in, in Philadelphia. And that principle is true for us as well, even though our experience is very different from the church in Philadelphia. Mine. We belong to him. What an encouragement to go out into this next week. I would love to have played a song for you at this point, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to kind of quote the words to you. It's a song by a Girl, if you, if you get a chance to listen to it, Lauren Daigle, you say, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than, uh, am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. And then he it goes to the chorus, but then it goes on. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. Taking all I have, and I am laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God. You have every victory. And then the chorus line, which she repeats after each of those verses. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. And you say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe. I believe what you say of me. I think that is the very heart of what God says to the church in Philadelphia. And ultimately, the heart of what God says to us as we seek to follow him. Let's pray together. Father, we turn to you this morning and we thank you for the words of encouragement that you give to us through what you said to the church in Philadelphia. We thank you for the principles that you give to them. Father, for the fact that you know everything about us. Uh, that we are able to depend on the promises that you give to us and that we know that we belong to you and that we are able to overcome in the world in which we live through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony because you are faithful. So help us as we go from here. As we've gathered for witness or gathered for worship, gathered to worship you, in awe and have that sense of your presence. So enable us as we scatter for witness to make known Jesus in all things. So hear our prayers because we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together the splendor of the King.
I can say thank you again for joining with us in worship this morning here in person. Thank you for joining with us online. Thank you to Barton and to Connor for uh, recording the service. Thanks to Alice and Andrew for playing for us. Thank you to um, Brian and Amanda and Riona for doing tea. And also James and Beth last week. I didn't get that. Um, and thank you to those who've welcomed everybody into, into church this morning. Um, it's really good to be in God's presence and, and to worship him. Let's, let's pray together again. Please do stay for tea and coffee after the service. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for being with us in our worship this morning. Just enable us we go out uh, as we seek to serve you and to follow you and to exalt Jesus. Now we pray that you would part us with your blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.